as we uh, start things here today in regard to, to sermon, let's, uh, let's do a little exercise. Some of you may remember it from your uh, Sunday school days. I know that I do, uh, you know, where the Sunday school teacher would, would ask you to, to join your hands in a certain way. You were to interlock your, uh, your fingers uh, this way, your two, uh, two hands, and uh, the teacher would say, uh, this is the church. And then you'd point your two index fingers uh, up, and, you'd, and she would say, well, this is the steeple. And then you open the doors, and lo and behold, there are all the people. Hey, what do you say? Let's give that a try. So we'll, uh, uh, this is the church. Uh, this is the steeple. You open the doors, and here are all the people. Do you see yourself there? Do you see one another in that? We all know that the church is not so much building by any stretch of the imagination, but the church is uh, all the people that, uh, that make it up. The church is endued with those who are called out you know, the Greek word for, for church is ecclesia. You know, that, uh, that English word ecclesiology and ecclesiastical and all that sort of thing, it means to be called out. Those who are part of the church are, uh, are called out and come together and then are called to go forth to be uh, God's uh, servants and disciples in the life of the world. So this is the church this is a steeple. You open the doors, and there's all the people. And the richness of God's people seeking to be fed, seeking to be inspired, uh, seeking to be challenged, and then going forward into the life of the world to be his people. I love the church. I've got to tell you that. I always, uh, always have. From uh, an early age, the church has always been an important part of my life. That's not always the case with, uh, with every person. I realize that. But for me, uh, church was uh, always an important part of my life for which I have always, always been thankful. I've always appreciated uh, being with others of like mind and of like spirit, particularly as it relates to this, this, this common desire to, uh, to come before God and to know and understand Jesus more deeply. It's always resonated for me, even at a young age, and I've been very, very thankful for that. I love the fellowship of the church. Some of my, uh, my best friends uh, have, uh, have come in and around the, the fellowship of the church. In fact, many of those relationships have, have endured uh, through many, many years of, of life, uh, great friendships, all of which have been founded in Jesus, which makes them even more rich, even more special. For me, the church is a really big deal, and I'm not paid to say that. Uh, even if I wasn't a pastor of, the church, of a church, of this church, I would still say the church is a really big deal. Being a, a part of a church, being a part of this church, is, is that important to me. Today we read about the, the church from its earliest days. Uh, we, uh, we find ourselves focusing in on a portion of Acts chapter 2. But we know in that uh, larger passage, if you read through, uh, we know that Pentecost happened, that Peter preached, and that the church was born. In Acts 2, 42 and following, Luke offers there at the very end of that chapter, uh, chapter 2 of Acts, uh, a brief yet very wonderful summary of the day-to-day -day discourse of the church. It's almost just placed in there to give a, give a snatch, a snapshot of, uh, of what the church was about in its earliest days. And it forms a really neat foundation for any church, even our own church, as we uh, live things out in 2022. So we read about those things, that rhythm, those foundational things that were going on in church, paying particular attention to the importance of fellowship. So let's read then from God's Word. We read today Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. Let's hear this from God's Word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with, with awe at the, the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and with, with glad and, and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is God's word. May it be a deep and abiding blessing to each of us as we hear this word read and as we make effort now to take our lives and apply them to this word. May God bless us in that. Well, suffice it to say that the early New Testament church got off to a really great start. Not that there weren't bumps along the way, not that there weren't disagreements, not that there weren't growing pains, but let's, let's say that the early New Testament church got off to this wonderful start. It was not perfect by any means, but yet God was moving and forming and making himself known through the church. In Acts 2, we read about Pentecost. At Pentecost, we know that over 3,000 souls had gathered for worship. The Holy Spirit came in the rush of a mighty wind. Tongues of fire rested on each individual. Those gathered began to speak in languages that were foreign uh, to their own, and, and people marveled at that which was going on. Peter preached uh, the good news about Jesus. In fact, he, uh, he offered a, a, a notion of, uh, of, of the gospel narrative, if you will, dating all the way back to the very beginning, making his, his way through the, the, God's work as witnessed in the Old Testament and then bringing it to the present day of Christ coming, of living, dying, and rising from the dead, and now the very power and presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. The church was birthed that day. And we learn of that in this great second chapter of the book of Acts. Those who made up the early New Testament church were devoted, and we should underline that, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were serious, very serious, about building fellowship. They celebrated the, the Lord's Supper on a regular basis, and they were all about offering their prayers to God. And so these things formed the, the, the sort of rhythm of that church. They were foundational to, the, to, to what was going on. They, they were fundamental to the life of God's fledgling church. I'm particularly struck as I consider those foundational things that were going on about the church's desire for fellowship. Fellowship was a, a, a very important thing as the church was living its life together. The Greek word used for fellowship in this passage from Acts 2 is koinonia. You may have, uh, may have know of that word. Koinonia has to do with a, a deep and, and intimate, uh, almost personal uh, relationship with, uh, with, with other people. And it dives deeply into what it means to be in relationship. Koinonia happens when, relations, when, when relationships are, in fact, very deep. Where, where trust is evident. It, it just is, is palpable when, when koinonia is going on. When koinonia happens, uh, needs are met. People become aware of needs, and they, they seek to meet the needs as best they can. And when koinonia happens, of course, all are included. Nobody is excluded. All are welcome. People come and, and they, they, they sense the, the richness of the fellowship and are struck by the same. Those who made up the, the early church cared for one another very deeply. And in that, it was evident in their fellowship. They looked out for one another, even to the point where looking out for one another came at, at great personal sacrifice. Scripture is very clear about that. Their, their fellowship together was, was winsome. And, and contributed to the, the growth of the church. It was winsome to the extent that people noticed what was going on among those who were called Christian. And they had this 
deep uh, awareness of that and became curious and, and, and wanted to become a part. And as they began to seek, they, they were welcomed into the fellowship and, and new life in Christ was struck. Their love for one another in that early New Testament church was always evident. Whether they were gathered in the temple and they made a daily practice of doing that, or whether they gathered for one another at their home, with one another at their homes, uh, oftentimes uh, breaking bread together, the church uh, filled a, a deep seated need to belong. Now, whether you're in the, the first century or in the 21st century, the, the need to belong is common to every person. I hope that you believe that about yourself, this need to belong, and that's a part of your response in being a part of church. I hope also that you recognize that in, in the lives of other people. They, too, have a need to belong. And that need for belonging is, uh, is, is captivated in a, in a lot of different ways sometimes in ways that are not very becoming, not very positive. There is no better way for, for people to experience the richness and the wholeness of belonging than through the life of the church. There's just something in us that wants to connect with something or someone that is beyond ourselves. We all have that common need and desire to, to belong. And the church affords us that opportunity. Through the church, we're, we're given the opportunity not only to connect with God, but to connect with each other. The recent pandemic, and it's still with us, but, but we hope that it is passing and that we are indeed emerging. But, but we know that the recent pandemic really did a number on relationships. There was a, a portion when we were in the depths of, of, the, of the pandemic to where we were, uh, were very much separated from one another. It really did a number on us uh, emotionally, psychologically, sometimes even spiritually. And if we're really honest uh, with one another, the pandemic really did a number on the, on the church. We shouldn't be surprised because the church, if anything, is built on relationships, certainly our relationship with God, our relationships with, with each other. Thank God we, uh, we had this deep desire to be with one another, that we saw fit, even in the depths of the pandemic, to, to gather together in small groups. A lot of that was, was done by Zoom. And we realized that, that to have a Zoom meeting is, is no substitute for, for being together. Uh, to being in, in the flesh, in person, with each other. The same was true for our efforts in, in, in worship. Uh, we, we made available uh, during the pandemic and still do opportunities for worship via the internet, but we know that, uh, that being uh, 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 in worship virtually is, is not the same as, uh, as being in worship in person. It's time as we emerge from the pandemic, that we come together, all of us, every time we can. When I started writing this sermon uh, earlier in the week, on the, and, and as I was thinking and writing on this core value of being community-oriented, I wrote down two words there at the very top of my, my notes, Sunday brunch. I guess on Monday morning, I was remembering what a great time it was, what a great meal it was. Maybe I was a little bit hungry at the time, but I wrote out Sunday brunch. Last Sunday, it was so good to sit down and enjoy a good meal together, but it was even better to just uh, sit across a table and to talk with one another. It's always good to be together. Always good to celebrate our relationships with one another as we come together. As I've often said, uh, as we've emerged from the pandemic, I will never, ever again take for granted the assembling of ourselves together. It is good to be together. We just have that need within us to, to, to belong, to, to share life together. And indeed, when it comes to Christian fellowship, essentially what we're doing is doing life together. Getting together is a sweet thing indeed. 
It's time that we all come together. It will do us good emotionally, relationally, and above all things, spiritually. You may have heard the, the story of the pastor who was visiting with one of his parishioners who hadn't been to church for, for a long time. Uh, he made that visit. It was in the dead of winter, and as the two gathered, they did so around the, the fellow's um, uh, fireplace. And as the conversation went along, the, the pastor um, encouraged the man about returning to church, and then he, he took a pair of uh, tongs from the fireplace set that was just off the, the side of the hearth, and he removed an ember from the fire, and he placed it just to the side. Now, that ember burned for a while, but then it really wasn't that long before it began to burn out. Immediately, the pastor took that ember with the tongs, and he put it back in the fire. And as you might guess, the ember burst back into flames. And we all get the message. We simply cannot go very long spiritually without being in the spiritual fire of the church. I have visited countless shut-ins down through the years. And on so many occasions, that, uh, that person who is shut in, if you will, will say, I so want to be there. If I could, I would be there. That deep desire to be together. In, the wor in a word, the, the church is not so much a matter of God and me, but it's a matter of God and we. I hope we understand that. It's not just God and me, but God and we. The universe does not circulate around us as individuals, particularly when it comes to church, because we're all in this together as God has called us out, as God has called us together, and then as God calls us forth. Let's face it, though. This is an age where individualism is valued. And when that... Um, when that comes to pass, then um, there's a certain selfishness that comes to it. We, we hear the term rugged individualism all the time. It's sort of kicked around, and, and when you consider that sort of rugged individualism, it's always a matter of looking out for number one. When push comes to shove, the concern for oneself begins to trump concern for the needs of other people. This even bleeds into our spiritual lives. You know, a lot of the devotional material that we look at, and I, I do this every day repeatedly, to be quite honest with you, centers on what God can do for me and the needs that, that I have. And I would say that a lot of the devotional material that you look at, at is the same way, how God can, can deal with me and, and the needs that, that I have. And because of that, intention. And because that happens over time, we begin to lose sight of the fact that, that, that it's really not a, an I thing, but it's a we thing. We, we begin to lose sight of the, the needs of other people when we're only con always concerned about our own needs. Again, it's not just God and, and I, but God and, and we. Believing and belonging go hand in hand. In hand. And it's been that way from the very beginning. You can read uh, Acts 2, 42 and following and, and find that to be the case. They, they were always together with good intention of worshiping God, of sharing the good news about Christ, of, of championing the good life that they were sharing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Some live with a mistaken notion that they can maintain their walk with Christ separate from other people. And when it comes right down to it, it is a mistaken notion. Take Jesus, for instance. He was always about building community. He invested heavily in the lives of his disciples. He did that for a specific reason. One, to be in relationship with them but also to raise them up so that they would be equipped to do the very same thing with other people. 
because he knew that he would need them to go and invest in other people, particularly after he was gone. Paul spent the bulk of his time building the church. Paul's understood as the, the, the greatest evangelist that has ever lived. But one of the things that Paul did is that he made sure that people who were being won to Christ were gathered together in groups, gathered together in, in churches of, of whatever size, so that they would be able to keep the embers of their spiritual lives burning together. Paul's writings are full of ways that, that Paul encouraged the church, even held the church accountable, reproved the church, reproved the church for things that, that maybe were going askew. Paul spent a tremendous about, amount of time ordering the church because he knew how important the church would be down through the ages if the entire world would be one to Jesus. Paul knew that, that the church was critical for the evangelization of the world. Today, the church, despite its many failings, still stands as the best hope for humanity. And think about it. You and I hold uh, an honored seat in the mix of that uh, grand enterprise. We are a part of what, it, in fact, is the best hope for humanity. And when it comes to this I and we thing, there are just some things that we do together that we simply cannot do by ourselves. These days, we're seeing geese flying all over the place. And usually when we see geese flying all over the place, they're flying in formation. There is a, a method to their madness. Flying in a, in a V, like the, the, the slide that you see here, provides a, an uplift for all the geese who are flying. The one in the, the front first provides that uplift, and then everyone in succession behind. You know, the one in, in front is only in front for just a bit. That goose, after a while, will, uh, will fall back to the back of the line, and another will take his place. All along, the geese are honking. We hear that honking all the time. Even if we don't see the geese, we hear the honking. They're honking encouragement. There's nothing like encouragement, is there? Encouraging one another in the things that are going on. Encouraging one another. If perchance a goose is injured or becomes sick, one or two of the geese will, will fall out of, uh, out of the, the formation as well in order to tend to the needs of the one who is either or sick or hurt. The point is this. Geese are all about we, just as we should be. My buddy Larry Stess wrote in his uh, blog uh, just this past week uh, a word that I feel is very much appropriate for what we're talking about today. He says that Christian discipleship must be personal, but it can't be private. It's very much a, a, an, an, an individual thing uh, when it comes to, to our discipleship, our life in Jesus. Uh, we just talked in, uh, in, in confirmation class just a few minutes ago about individually receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Yeah, a Christian discipleship must be personal, but it cannot be private. There's a corporate nature to it. We yoke together with others of the faith. We, we come together to, to, to worship and praise our God, to, to hold one another accountable, also to encourage one another, to be with one another in, uh, in need. Essentially, what, what Larry's saying, as he writes, is that we can never hope to attain Christian maturity apart from Christian community. It's just uh, not going to happen. Christian maturity and Christian community go hand in hand. Larry also asserts that uh, th there is a need for all of us to look beyond ourselves and see the needs of others, those within the fellowship and those even beyond. You see, God created us to be in relationship. And as we have said so often when it comes to relationship, there's both a vertical and a horizontal plane. We're to love God, 
and to love other people. We're called to do just that, to give our lives to God in a deep and unrequited love and to do the same with other people, to be there in love for each other. So we have uh, said as a matter of identity that we will be oriented toward community. All along, I've understood uh, this core value of being community-oriented as a, as a matter of community right here, our fellowship as a church. Now, many, as they have uh, talked about being community-oriented, as they've looked at the, the, the core values that, that are along the, the, the windows of our lobby, they, they think of being community-oriented as being out there, out in the community. I think there's, a, there's a, a, an intertwine here that's, that's so terribly important for us to, uh, to understand. I've always thought about that community of being here in this fellowship, this community, uh, and yet others have thought about it being out there in the community at large. Really, the community here and the community out there really are intertwined. We know that to be the case in, in who we are, so there's a depth of, uh, in, in being uh, community-oriented. The fact is this. As our community goes here, our influence in the community out there will either increase or decrease. It all depends on the strength and maturity of our community right here. To be community-oriented, and I'm talking about fellowship here, is never a call to become inward-focused. In fact, when it comes to Christian fellowship, the community of the believers, it, 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 it is just the opposite. Sure, we, we give attention to what's going on here, but our eye is always toward what's going on out there. Our scripture for today teaches this, that the early church enjoyed the favor of all the people. Now, all this is pre-persecution, and that began to happen after the turn of the first century. But they enjoyed the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number all those who were being saved. If our community is strong here, there will be a winsomeness to our ministry that will attract others just like it did for the early New Testament church. They had strong fellowship, and that strong fellowship had a winsome quality to it that literally drew others to that same fellowship. If our community is strong here, we will naturally want others to join us, and we'll invite them to do just that. A community, a fellowship that is strong and mature, will not be cliquish will not be turned inward, but will be strong in, in, in its, in its uh, awareness of, of, of who it is. And in that strength and health, we'll, we'll naturally want to invite other people to be a part of that which is bringing such strength and health to their lives. If our community is strong here, we will rejoice in the blessings of our church and stand ready to share those same blessings with those who are around us. Hence, we'll just want to offer all sorts of invitation, whether it be to the fall festival next Sunday, or to worship, or to, to small group, or to whatever it is. We're sharing in blessings. Let's offer the, the opportunity for the same to be a part of the, the lives of other people out in the community. Make no mistake about it. Our community here will influence community out there. In fact, I'll be so bold as to say that that's already happening. This is a strong fellowship that, that is uh, characterized by a deep sense of community, koinonia, if you will, that then has, uh, has effect upon what's going on out there. It happens all the time, literally every day for which I am very, very thankful and very, very honored to be a part of. So then, let's stay at it when it comes to community. 
when it comes to fellowship, the sort of koinonia that we've talked about. Let's not shy away from, from doing life together. Essentially, that's what we're doing. Let's not shy away from that. Let's revel in it. Let's, let's make it that, that central part of our lives. And, and above all, let's be a people who are in love with God and in love with one another. And in that, may God gain all the praise and glory. And may his kingdom be furthered as we seek to minister together as St. John United Methodist Church. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your uh, deep and abiding love. Thank you for calling us to be a part of church. Thank you for the blessings of church. Lord, thank you for the blessing of fellowship. Lord, we offer you thanks for the love that we share with each other. We praise you for the opportunity to be in relationship with each other. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to be mindful of our fellowship. May we be all about building community as your spirit leads and guides us. Touch us, Lord. We humbly pray that you would uh, lead us to be the church that you would have us to be. We love you. We, we seek to give you our lives. We seek to serve through the church. And in that, we do pray that you gain praise and glory and that your kingdom is furthered. This prayer we make in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let's think on these things. Let's uh, not just think on them, but let's find ourselves ready to respond. Let's think on our life in Christ. Let's open our hearts to all that is Christ. May we find ourselves empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's use this as a time of uh, prayer and contemplation, a time of deep response as we seek to live in